So I salute each and every one with the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. Uh, we welcome you to T.L. Elliott Ministries Bible Study. I am Apostle Elliot to some, Dr. Elliot to others. Uh, but on tonight, uh, we continue once again with a series of teaching regarding one of the books of the Old Testament. And the book that I'm referring to is the book of Obadiah. Obadiah, one of the profound prophets of the Old Testament that the Lord saw fit that he would let a record be made of a word that he gave to this particular prophet. And as I enunciate uh, the subject of tonight, the prophet Obadiah, I remind each and every one that's listening that we can't take lightly the vessel that the Lord God uses because um, many people miss the power in even the messenger that was chose to deliver the word of the Lord. And I'm not blowing up the man, but I'm blowing up the name of the man uh, because I remind each and every one, each and every time going into Bible study. So it sets the parameter of how you frame your mind uh, to listen and process what's being said. So in that, as we uh, hopefully can understand, um, the name Obadiah is speaking to a character or a characteristic, uh, which means a servant of the Lord, which means um, a mouthpiece uh, of the prophet, the one who is the clarion, the one who speaks and serves the Lord in opening their mouth in conjunction with demonstrating the character of the Lord God and who they are. Obadiah, once again, his name means servant of the Lord God. And in that, it also enunciate the characteristic of a servant by him being a worshiper and a praiser of Yahweh as we understand the Hebraic name of the Lord God uh, for the Hebrews, Yahweh. Uh, so, so in that, I enunciate that and what else we, we come to discover, what's just so very profound is the fact that this, some people would consider a quick read because they say, well, it's only one chapter, but uh, as we've seen in part one, part two, and part three, there is much depth of revelation. There's much depth of meat in each and every verse when we began to take it apart and not read it as just a history book, but read it as a prophetic book or book of preparation uh, for those who are looking to live eternally based on the spiritual journey that they live in this life. I continue to reiterate in each and every teaching uh, to take you out of the comfort zone of even looking at this in the natural context. It's easy for an individual to look at it from the natural. But what's profound is being able to look at it and examine the word in order to see what is the spiritual message that's being spoken in order to feed it to your soul for its maturing, for its perfecting, for eternal living. Amen. So in that, once again, I challenge each and every one that may be participating in this teaching. Let's get out of the natural and let's begin to look at the spiritual because as we continue to look at this from the spiritual perspective, now you can see yourself in the text. Now you can see it applicable to your life versus looking at it as an external read that you make a disconnection that that it, it, it's not talking about you it's talking about them and so in that i just once again by the grace of the holy spirit continue to reiterate that in each and every teaching as 
uh, the Lord has given me the instruction in order to teach it from a spiritual perspective in order to hopefully bless you, to get you to another level of understanding to say, now I can see this word being applicable. Now I can see this word giving me spiritual eyesight or discernment to be able to see the difference in right and wrong versus allowing myself to be stupefied by all the natural things that I see. To, to discontinue myself not being able to get beyond the natural in my understanding to be in a better place and be more sound in who I am in my thoughts or in my mind so that my flesh or my natural emotion is not driving my actions but my spirit begins to drive my soul based on what my soul needs to know in order to live eternally. So in that, as I have stated here, we have already done part one, part two, and part three to cover verses one through verse 14. And as we looked at those previous verses, if I may just do a mild recap, as we looked at uh, uh, the first nine verses of the chapter, they dealt with the prediction, the prophecy of a judgment on Edom or the Edomites. And as we, we talk about the Edomites in the natural, we're talking about descendants of Esau. But if we look at that in the spiritual, we're talking about the descendants that continue to be of the flesh or be of the natural mindset who are not spiritual, who, who are doing things the hard way. When we began to, to uh, continue in this, especially as we looked at verses 1 through 9, when we pick up at verse 10 through verse 14, we began to look and understand the reason for the judgment that comes upon Edom or the reason for the judgment of the Lord that shall come upon mankind that has no relationship with him. And what we begin to discover is there's some characteristics that are associated with the adversary. One of the most profound things that we were able to extrapolate when we looked at the scriptures very closely here by the prophet Obadiah, we began to see the character of Lucifer. We began to see the character of Satan. We began to see the character of pride and arrogance that now has birthed itself in a people that has transcended from the heavens. And I say that because once again, we looked at Isaiah chapter 14, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer? When we began to exalt scriptures, Proverbs 16, 18, pride comes before fall that we understood with the adversary. And in that, what becomes very profound that we can understand not only here by the prophet Obadiah, but we can understand it by all of the other prophets that we've, we've previously looked at. When we look at Yoel, when we look at Amos, when we began to look at all these different individuals who have prophesied or given a word of preparation unto the people of the Lord, as well as those that the Lord desires to get back in right standing with him. We began to see that there is a characteristic of arrogance that birthed itself in the heavens, pride that birthed itself in the heavens that now as a, a side effect or as uh, a, a, an evolution of this pride and arrogance of the adversary falling from the grace of the Lord God of being in the heavens and being before the stones in his presence, now we see it birthed itself in human beings that continued to transcend itself from the days of Adam all the way down to, to mortal man in the state of what has been the descendants of the patriarchs. And so now we look at the brother, or should I say the descendants of the brother of Jacob or Jacob, who is later renamed Israel, he who the Lord has prevailed with. And in this, we began to, to see that there is a sibling dispute that's here, not so much on Israel's side, but still on Esau's side with his descendants, because the reality of the matter 
that we find the judgment of the Lord that comes upon mankind is one about his pride and arrogance. But something else begins to show itself or rear its head up. The judgment of pride and arrogance really personifies itself between siblings. If there is something that the Lord is acknowledging through the prophets regarding Jacob and Esau, it begins to speak to us as believers when we begin to look at things with spiritual eyes. When we begin to look at the situation uh, uh, through spiritual discernment, what he really says to us in this day and in this hour, how are you treating your brother? For those who, who have uh, 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 not been delivered, those who still have the Esau mentality, those who have the Edomite mindset, how are you dealing with them as a people? In the same turn, it begins to speak and say for those who are like Edomites, what are you doing to your brethren? Are you claiming that you're children of the Lord God or students of the Lord God? Or you're claiming that you're in the family of the Lord God, but you don't treat others like your family. You don't treat others who are in the body of Christ the same. You treat them like they're your enemy. And see, this is the thing that really gets, if I can say as a cliche under the Lord's skin that we now can understand that has transcended from prophet to prophet and the Lord turns around and makes sure that the message is delivered loud and clear because see one thing that I will continue to say for those who are theologians that research the Old Testament, you come to discover it wasn't that one prophet lived and then they went off the scene and another one came on the scene. In most instances, throughout the duration of the Old Testament, when it came to the prophets, usually it was three or four prophets that existed at the same time. They were just preaching in different areas of Jerusalem or Israel, but yet they had the same message. They had the same word. And what's so very profound is the Lord does it like an orchestra. He, he, he lets different backgrounds of individuals come with his character that is like a melodious sound of his word, i.e. that he's saying the same thing through different prophets, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what their background is. And the thing is, what else is so profound is the fact that some of the most profound word that he gave and the people that he chose, they weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They weren't individuals who were of no notoriety. They weren't individuals who came from, from uh, a wealthy families per se in order to set their precedence of what they had to say that people would say, I'll listen. They came from, as one of my former bishops would say, from the backside of the desert. They came from a place where they weren't known and brought to the front to where they were known based upon the word that came out of their mouth that comes into fruition because it was something that the Lord God God gave them to enunciate. So now, as I say that, I know some say, wow, man of God, you're, you're, you're uh, passionate about this thing, even with the history of the prophet. And I, I, I have to say, yes, we have to be passionate about it because here's the thing. What made the prophets profound for the word that they had is it was a word of preparation. So that means I have to be excited about getting prepared. I have to be excited. Listen to me right now. I hope this is resonating with someone that's participating. I have to be excited about getting prepared because in my preparation, it makes the transition for where I have to go or what I have to achieve easier. When I'm not prepared, that's what brings anxiety. That's what brings distress. That's what brings worry. And, and, and I hope this is resonating with somebody that's listening to me right now. You need to tell yourself and prophesy to yourself, I need to quit worrying. I need to quit being in distress. If I were going to get prepared, then all will be well. So, so in that, I'm believing all is going to be well when we understand from the spiritual perspective about the preparation that is necessary. So now, in that, watch this, as, as we once again touched in the previous teachings from Obadiah 
in these previous verses, I like how verse 12 and verse 13 brought out uh, six significant characteristics of pridefulness or arrogance that the Lord God looks down on. And so as I brought these out before, it kind of makes you want to check yourself. First one that I mentioned is uh, looking unrighteously upon others, i.e. your brethren or those who have the potential of being in the body of Christ. I should not be looking down on individuals. I should have a desire to look up or have them be looking up or moving upward in the direction of the Lord. Number two, uh, uh, rejoicing unrighteously in their affliction or in their demise. Number three, uh, speaking continually in arrogance, speaking continually prideful, like I'm all that in a bag of chips or, or as if I can do everything on my own and I don't need the Lord God in my life in order to achieve the things that need to be achieved. Uh, number four, entering into the gate or entering to the places of opportunity that weren't meant for me, i.e. trying to force myself into the things that the Lord God has not called me into, trying to force myself into the bountifulness or the blessing that doesn't belong to me, trying to force myself into things that the Lord has not called or invited me to. Number five, looking down on the affliction, looking down on what's what's a fault, looking down on what's in error, looking down on what is an illness. Because see, while we're looking down on the affliction of others, we fail to realize that we're afflicted within ourselves. I hope this is, is prophesying or preparing somebody, even in the state, as you continue to assess yourself. And the last one that the prophet brings out is laying hands on other strength, putting uh, uh, your sense of direction in the midst of the authority that the Lord has given to someone else versus you. So in this, this is something that really sets the foundation of what the prophet brings out regarding characteristics that associate themselves with arrogance. So now, Tonight, we began to pick up with some new information. We began to break down a couple of new scriptures, amen. Uh, tonight, we transition, even in the same chapter, to focus in uh, prayerfully on verses 15 through 18. And when we look at verses 15 through 18, if I could give you a bit of a subject of what these verses are all about, it's the results of the judgment or the ordinances uh, that the Lord God releases on Edom or the Edomite mentality. This, watch this, is the result of what happens when you are in the mindset as believers that you don't want to help your brother. This is what is the consequences that comes along when we have the mindset of being like Esau towards a Jacob. This is the results of having the mindset or the characteristic of the Edomites that I just mentioned to you in arrogance that causes you to mistreat treat those who are of your spiritual family. So now let us begin to, to look at these scriptures on tonight. Amen. For those of you that have the word of the Lord with you, turn with me uh, to Obadiah chapter one, and let us begin to look at verse 15. And what the scripture says is for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. Now, this is a profound statement that the prophet declares, all right? He says, the day of the Lord is near and upon all the heathen. Now, what he's articulating, what I want, want to say to you is, remember, this thing, day, even though we could translate it from the Hebrew and say, yom, uh, which that is the word for day, however, Here's the understanding that you need to have because some people will look at day as 24 hours. As we say, there's seven days in a week. But yet, we also can look at day in the correlation of a significant period of time. But the profound revelation I want you to get from this 
is to remember we're talking a prophetic word. We're talking a preparing word that the Lord has through the prophet. So now we're stepping a little bit beyond those termination, uh, 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 meanings of the word day to begin to look at day as the working, because see day is also a metaphor in the Hebraic dialect for laboring for what you do in the day is as one would consider your profession. If you're going to earn wages for your household, then it's deemed by what work that you go do during the day in order, once again, to earn the wages in order to take care of your family or take care of your household. So now, when you understand it like that, now it begins to speak very profoundly to you in the spirit that the day of the Lord is really talking about the working of the Lord in and through individuals. All right. It's not just da 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 da. Here comes the Lord. Many people understand it in that, but the Lord manifests based upon his first manifestation within you. In 1 John, I think it's 1 John chapter 3, it says, We shall see him as he is. How can we see him as he is, though, unless he can see himself in you? In order for him to physically come, he first spiritually comes or manifests within who he's coming for. Because watch this, even in the natural, the laws of physics is likes attract likes. So he's attracted to himself. And if he's attracted to himself, he's looking for himself to be manifested in you to come get himself. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. So in that, it says for the day of the Lord or the working in and through and out of you of the Lord is near, meaning it's at hand or it's in that season. It's in that time frame. All right. If it's not already happening, then you're on the cusp of it happening. In this, he says, for the day of the Lord is upon all the heathen. Now, here's something else that I bring to you as a revelation. Note that it says, it's upon all the heathen. The word upon means up and on. So now this revalidates what I just said. The day of the Lord is the working in and through and out or up on an individual. So, so in this, it says, the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen or when it, it, or should I say, he will manifest in or through or upon heathen, i.e. what is a heathen other than the Hebrew word goy, which means foreigner or a Gentile or in the reality of the matter, one who has no relationship with him or doesn't know him, i.e. doesn't know the Lord. The Lord knows each and every one of us, but those who don't know him or don't have a relationship with him, uh, they are called heathen or called Gentiles. They're non-worshippers. They have not selected him as the Lord God who they serve or worship or praise. So in that, he says, there's a day that's coming that I've got to work in, on, or through individuals who have not met me or have not come into a relationship with me that they choose me as their Lord and as their God that they decide that they want to worship and serve me, i.e. celebrate me, which is how they honor me or value me. So in this, he says, there's a colon there. Now, the verse begins to articulate this. He says, as thou hast done, it shall be unto thee. Now, what's being said? The prophet declares that the reason that the Lord has to do a work in, through, and upon those who don't have a relationship with him, i.e. the heathen, is because of what they spent their time doing to their brethren before the Lord begins to deal with them internally. 
Notice, as I stated before, what were the characteristics of arrogance that the Lord does not like within the midst of each and every individual? Because, see, as long as you have these characteristics, you don't have him. He says, this doesn't match me. It, it, it wars with my spirit. It wars with my character when you operate in a character that doesn't demonstrate mine. Because if you're operating in a character that doesn't demonstrate his, then that means that uh, 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 you are not really in his name. Let me let you chew on that for a minute. You're not really operating in his name. Remember, name uh, uh, in the Greek is a noma. In the Hebrew, it's shem, which means character or reputation. So he's like, really, you prostitute my name saying that you my people, but yet you don't act like what my name stands for. So you're not a family builder because, see, even for people to be sons unto the Lord, not just biological sons like a mother and father produces a, a, a male child, son for the Lord uh implies one who is a name or a character builder that extends the name beyond the parent. They, i.e., take the mantle of the parent's name and continue to live in honor regarding that name. Think about it. When, when fathers rename sons after themselves, sometimes they'll name them the same first name, but watch this. They all don't avoid the same last name. And be it that they bear the same last name, whatever the reputation that the father built regarding uh, their name, like, like, like we say, a man's name is his honor. A man's name is his, watch this, credit. A man's name is what authority goes along with his household. So in that, if a son honors the father, he not only upholds the, the, the name that the father has built or tied to his name, the son goes beyond that to make the name greater. How does he make the name greater other than living in the character that the father was in to establish the name that he inherited? And then the son continues to even do greater in that to, to allow that name to go beyond the territorial bounds to places uh, and territories where the name now becomes known. So when we understand that, now we can understand understand the greatness of who the Lord God is when he names us his own, when we're chosen, when we're picked to be proven or to be tested regarding the name that has been placed on us. Because see, the Lord God is like, even though you take my name, there's a price that goes along with the name that you've taken because it is a characteristic that you got to uphold. And as you uphold the characteristic, it means you're going to have to go through some things in order to maintain that name. Because the thing is that name, uh, no other name above the heavens and under the heavens is greater than it. It is is the characteristic that defies all things natural and supernatural. I hope I'm ministering to somebody on tonight. But but in this it says once again, what thou hast done uh, to your brothers, not looking out for them in the family name. Now the recompense or the price that's paid back to you is everything that you did to discredit your brother or not take care of your brother and i.e. your spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ who claim to be part of the same family as you and you claim to be part of the same family with them. I know this is speaking to somebody, but listen to what we're saying because this is a word, a right now word for us as the believer. It says, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. All right. And and remember, this ain't something that the prophet just prophesied. Jesus turns around and says the same thing in the New Testament. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Could it be that it was just another rendition of a prophetic word that correlates or, or codifies what's being said here? Because Jesus is saying, 
if you don't treat others the way you want to be treated and part of your family, it's going to end up being a curse that comes against you and causes you not only to be out of fellowship with the Lord, but it will cause damnation and it will cause judgment or ordinances to be served on your life that now will make things even more difficult for you uh, to endure if it is meant for you to live eternally. So now, what does he say? Still here in the same verse. He says, thy reward. Now he's beginning to articulate. He says, thy reward. All right. Now, here's the thing. Notice that he didn't say thy award. He said your reward. And now I emphasize that because some people may not be aware. Notice that you don't find really the word award in the Bible. Uh, and because an award is something that is given for uh, a specific event that you work towards, and once the event is accomplished, then you have no more obligation to that event, i.e., like people will run a race and they'll get a trophy, or people will play sports, and at the end of the season, based on this exclusive event that you participated in, you received an award, all right? That is, is the conclusion of the matter. But a reward is a recompense, i.e. it is a repayment. Watch this. It's the same thing as to what people get a paycheck for. You perform a job in which you get a paycheck either every week or every other week, which your paycheck is a reward. You're being paid for what you have done. So in this Watch this. It says, thy reward. So the Lord says, I'm paying you for the job you've been doing. I'm paying you for the work you've been performing. So in this, he says, your reward shall return upon thy own head. Now, what's very profound that I find in this is he doesn't just say, uh, I'm going to give you your just reward. He says, the reward that I give you is going to return upon thy own head. Notice once again, here in this one verse, the word upon comes up again, meaning up and on thy head. And the word head is rosh in the Hebrew, which means the summit or the beginning place of life, or watch this, your mind or the, the place of your soul. So he says, the reward that I pay you for what you did to your brethren is going to be paid back to your soul or to your life force or to where your thoughts are. The thing is, your head is what drives the rest of your body. And so he says, the payment I give you is going to start right here with your cerebral. It's going to start with your soul. It's going to start with the spirit man. It's going to start with your life force. This is the judgment that he's giving. He said, I, I ain't going to first deal with your flesh. I'm going to first deal with your mind and your soul. So now, as we look at that, as we look at that now, let us look at verse 16. What does verse 16 say? He says, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. Wow, this is a very profound verse. There's a lot of meat in this verse, but let's let's begin to, to look at this. He says, through the prophet, for as ye have drunk, all right, meaning as you have partaken upon the wrath of God in my holy mountain. Now, now remember, watch this. Remember, we're talking about the Edomites. We're, we're talking about those who have an arrogant mindset, arrogant characteristic of their life. So in that, as they have pimped and prostituted the glory or the righteous things of God, but yet not lived in the character 
that validates those things. He says there's a recompense that happens. You can't just get in and fit in where you want to in me while you doing your own thing or doing unrighteousness, but yet you're pimping and prostituting the great things of me. He says in this, you are drinking of your own wrath out of my holy mountain out of my exalted place, out of the high place or the sacred place. You know what I'm saying? That's that's like you going and doing sacrilegious things in the midst or in the presence of the Lord God and think that you're not going to pay a price for it. Now, I'm going to bring something to your attention that's very profound in conjunction with this verse because this verse does re-manifest itself really again in the New Testament. And what I want to bring to your attention is if you hold your finger there and turn with me quickly to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 18, when John the Revelator is on the island of Patmos and he's getting in time prophecy. He's getting in time or the conclusion of time. Let, let, let me clarify that. Take this moment and clarify because some people think uh, when we say the end of time is that uh, uh, all of a sudden things come to a complete halt or a complete stop. But listen to what you're saying. You're saying the end of time, meaning time becomes no longer relevant. See, when we talk about the heavens, we talk about eternity, time no longer becomes relevant. It begins to move slower and slower the more you move to an eternal place to now it, it, it has no variance on anything there in the heavens. Because even for those who could say anything regarding space, you would understand that time slows down the further out that you go. So, so in this, watch this, this, this is what I want to bring to your attention that correlates with verse 16. It's like John the revelator got the rest of the revelation that Obadiah is prophesying here in verse 16. Now, when you turn to chapter 18 and what I want to pay close attention to, uh, is verse one through verse eight. I'm going to read these to you quickly. And I want you to just meditate on those as we continue to look at what Obadiah is saying. The scripture says in Revelation 18, one, and I'm reading to you from the standard King James, it says, and after these things, I saw another angel or messenger come down from heaven having great power or authority, and the earth was lightened with his glory, meaning the earth came to a place of revelation based upon his, his glory or his celebration of praise and worship because we get into the glory of God not by just being in the presence, but we're in his glory based on us celebrating him through our praise and worship. So that is being recognized on the messenger, the angel that's being uh, identified here in Revelation 18.1. Now, verse two, it says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen as become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, listen to what's, what's being said by uh, John in the book of Revelation. He says, Babylon or Babylos, which means confusion. Now, some may, may, may be pinching yourself right now and looking around even in the state that the world is in right now. And you can say, wow, we're in a state of confusion. We're in a state of, of anxiety. We're in a state of tribulation, like the word is talking about. So he says, uh, uh, confusion and tribulation is fallen, is fallen. It has come to the habitants of devils. And see, watch this. If I, if I can really be deep and touch somebody's theology on tonight, devils is not just in correlation to external entities. Sometimes you are your own devils because the devil is the false accuser. Satan is the accuser, but the devils is the false accuser. And one goes and studies the epistles of John. You come to discover that your unrighteous characteristics your arrogance, your negative nature becomes your own devils. So now, when, when you understand that in the spirit, listen to what it's saying. 
It says, now confusion has fallen and, and, and now uh, it has become the habitation of devils. The confusion has now cohabitated with your ungodly character, with your arrogance, with, with your, your negative emotional state that's being moved by your flesh. It says, in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, meaning it has become the bondage that has now wrapped itself in each and every individual. Watch this. For all nations, ha, listen, key word, all nations, meaning the Gentiles, meaning those who are foreign to the Lord God because they haven't accepted him as their Lord God and Savior and submitted to worshiping him and serving him. It says to all nations, watch this, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Wait a minute. Now, what does it say over here in verse 16 of Obadiah? For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they have not been or as they have never existed. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's, there's a parallel that is occurring right here. John is articulating the same concept that the prophet Obadiah is prophesying. And he says, he says, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, meaning those who are in positions of authority. This, this is those who have kingdom, or should I say, have had access to kingdom authority, but yet they have polluted it or diluted it because they have hybridized the authority of righteousness and mixed it with worldliness. They have come into the place that they've gone into the high mountain of God and have access what is the authority or dominion of the Lord, but yet they still operate in dominion of him while still being in arrogance of character that is as an Edomite. So in this, he says, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies or in the abundance of her arrogance. You know what I'm saying? H hybridizing the thing and prostituting the anointed teachings, the anointed revelations of the Lord God for personal gain. This, this is, this is, this is, this is the, 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 the revelation that we have to catch and begin to understand as to what's really being said here. So now, let us look at, at, at the next verse. And it says, and, and, and I'm still in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins or unrighteous thoughts or unrighteousness in character, and that you receive not of her plagues. Meaning that you don't receive the judgment or the ordinances of the Lord God that need to be delivered to bring correction. Watch this. Verse 6. Reward her even as she rewarded you. Meaning pay her back what she did uh, in payment towards you in which you were supposed to have been the family but yet you were treated like an outsider. Listen to this. He says, uh, 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 reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. So he says, not only repay, but give double payment. Listen, for, for what has been the mistreatment for the people of God the Lord God says there is a reward that's given back on those who have mistreated you. See, this should be a hallelujah shout for somebody because, see, in, in the times that you've been busted and disgusted, you, 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 you've been torn down in every possible way of being obedient unto the word of the Lord and, and being mistreated for who you are in your character of being his chosen the Lord says, be it that you have to be proven, be it that you have to be tested. And the thing is, for some who are testing you, not getting in right character and how they 
test you. He says, now there's a payment I'm going to give them back, but I'm going to let you give them a payment as well. Because now it talks about the double portion of the payment or the repayment as to what has been done towards you. Now, verse seven, still here in Revelation 18, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart or in her thoughts, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Arrogance puts individuals in a place that they can't see real pain in their own life. Arrogance or pride puts people in the place that they see themselves as better than the situation. And in that, they now dismiss any fault in the midst of the situation because they say they're above it. So in this verse 8, therefore shall her plagues come in one day or in one working uh, 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 death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Listen to everything that he's saying here. She'll be judged. She'll be judged. All right. Now, let us, let us go back and, 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 and look here in Obadiah once again. It says, Verse 16, for as she has drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. All right, they'll become intoxicated. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down, They're, meaning they'll digest. They'll digest and they shall be as though they had, uh, uh, had not been or had never existed. Watch this, verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Listen, listen, what, what's, what's going on here? And I want you to keep in mind, once again, Revelation 18. So he says, but upon are up and on Mount Zion. All right. Now, Mount Zion is, should I say, let me let me first touch the term Zion. Zion becomes a metaphorical term to say the holy place, or should I say uh, the separated place, and the utopia that is in. Jerusalem. And I want to say that because here's something else I want to bring to your attention. What's interesting is when you look at the word Zion in Arabic, it is Sayun. S-A-H-Y-U-N. Sayun. And what's interesting in the Arabic language is Sayun means valley. Now, some are saying Right now, well, man of God, why are you bringing out the valley in this about the terminology of Zion? Because Zion is being acknowledged as the mountain. All right. So watch this. A valley implies lowland or depression. Now, some people didn't know anything about uh land navigation, we look at a depression as an indentation. But when you get a revelation, uh, uh, a depression is also speaking to the, the negative emotion depression. My low place is my valley. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. People that are listening to me, when you are in a tough place, we, we, we say the cliche, I'm at my lowest place. We, we will even articulate, I'm in my valley experience. Because it's my place where I touch into my depression. I'm in my place that I touch into my anxiety or not feeling worth. Well, watch this. Mount Zion is supposed to be the pinnacle or the way to get out of your valley. It's a mountain that is being metaphorically spoken of in the middle of a valley. 
It's the place that you can look to the hills from which cometh your help. And the word says that my help cometh from the Lord. The hill that I'm looking to, as the writer is articulating, is the mountain or the high place that is being identified as Zion, the place of separation, the place of holiness, the place that shall be my utopia or my happy place outside of the midst of the valley that I'm in the middle of. So, so, so in this, watch this, he says, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. This is where you get rescued. Your high place is your rescuing. Understand when you get into a greater prophetic place than your stupor of the low place that you at, this is where your deliverance or your rescue comes. This is where salvation becomes your reality. This is where Jesus now is manifesting in your life as your process. Because remember, his name Jesus is Yahshua in the Hebrew. It's Esau in the Greek, which means savior. So, so in this, it means not only savior, it means deliverer. So my deliverance or my salvation comes to him, which is the high place in the midst of my valley experience, which now makes my Mount Zion, the metaphorical place, something of a reality for me, but yet it's only real for me as a spiritual individual. Here's what he says. And there shall be holiness or sacredness and separateness. And the house of Jacob, which Jacob or Yaakov means the supplanter, one that holds one back, shall possess their possessions. Meaning they shall take occupancy or ownership of those things uh, uh, that they were meant to take control of i.e. property, i.e. the metaphorical meaning is your thoughts. Everybody that had a strategic thought to uh, manipulate and hold back other folks in order to get an advance, them once they come into the revelation, I'm talking about the Jacobs that, are, that I'm speaking to right now, those who are the Yaakovs, those who, who were the tricksters for some time in their life, when they come to themselves, this is the spiritual revelation, when the Jacob in you comes to yourself and you begin to realize that you now can take control of your thoughts, now you're in a place of possession. Now you're in a place that some things can move in the midst of your life because now your deliverance is coming. The deliverance of the high place of the Zion is based on your thoughts getting delivered from being the Jacob to being the Israel, the one that the Lord has prevailed with. So now, if I can, let me touch one more verse because I, I want to conclude this segment of the chapter so it's a complete thought for each and every one that's listening. So now, let's look at, at, at verse 18 here in Obadiah. In verse 18, the scripture says, and keep in mind, once again, what we just read out of Revelation chapter 18, it says, and the house of Jacob or the house of Jacob shall be a fire. All right. And the house of Joseph for Yusef a flame and the house of Esau for stubble, for they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, remember here in verse 16, he says, it'll be as if they never existed because watch this, family begins to come together. What's being acknowledged here that the Lord says that the house of Jacob becomes as a fire. And then he says, and, and, and the house of Joseph, which means connection. Listen to me. Joseph, the Hebrew is Yusef, which means uh, Yehovah has added or connected. So based upon Jacob, the house of Jacob, the building of a Jacob connecting with the building of a Joseph or a Yusuf connection becomes the flaming fire that devours the Edomite or the Edomite mentality where nothing remains because see what should have been family now gets cut out of family and is no longer recognized. That's why the scripture says that, that 
Esau is as stubble, nothing but ash, nothing remains. There's, there's nothing that goes through the fire. As I was explaining to someone today, I said, when it comes to the Lord God and the fire that he brings, it's meant to be as a metallurgist. It, it, it's meant to be as a blacksmith. If anybody understands what I'm saying, what I'm trying to articulate to you, because even Malachi talks about this, uh, when he talks about fuller soap and, and so forth. And as we, as we look at, for instance, uh, uh, brimstone when it comes to hell of fire, it's not the fire that really burns up what's unlike God. It's the brimstone, which brimstone is what we would call in modern times sulfur. Sulfur is an antibiotic or a purifier that's put in the fire. So it's the sulfur that burns the impurities out of what's in the fire. But if you ain't got nothing pure in you, then what happens is the sulfur helps the fire consume everything that's in the fire. Are, are you understanding me? So, so, so in this, watch this, the Lord God is saying that the house of Jacob, i.e., which becomes Israel, and the house of Yusef, which means connection, becomes the fire. He becomes the sulfur, the purifier, and in that, sometimes it'll cause some family to be taken out of the picture. So in this, he says, for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken it. Because see, the name of Esau has already established its character of being of arrogance or to be the opposite of the character of God. It has identified itself as being rebellion. It has identified itself to not only rebel against a parent, but also rebel against the family that's even trying to do right and stay connected with it. Now, I know this is probably prophesying to somebody right now that's listening because you're saying, man, I never looked at this in this light from the spiritual perspective as something that I may be dealing with myself because I, 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 I may have been on the journey of wanting my life to be right, but sometimes I'm selfish in my own journey that I'm only worried about me, myself, and I, and I'm not worried about anybody else. I could care less as to the destiny or the divine destiny of another individual to include my own family, to include my own friends, to include those that I don't even even though, but yet who are saying they're seeking or searching for the true living God in order for their lives to be delivered. So, so in that, I deposit that on tonight. I deposit that into the minds of each and every individual that's participating in this teaching. And I pray this has just been a profound word of revelation to take you to a whole nother understanding of what the consequences are when it comes to the judgment of the Lord God against those who don't treat their own family or their own brethren right according to the word of the Lord, according to his character and according to his spirit. Amen. Amen and amen.